One off hearing today on food and fuel price inflation. Um, we're very grateful uh, that four of the supermarkets have come to give evidence to us uh, this morning. Um, so we have uh, Gordon Gaffer, who's the commercial director at Tesco. Good morning. morning. Uh, Chris Comerfeld, who's the chief commercial officer at ASDA. Good morning. Uh, Rianne Bartlett, who is the food commercial director at Sainsbury's. Hi. And David Potts, who's the CEO of Morrison. So good morning to all four of you. Um, uh, we're going to want to ask questions today on two issues. First is the long-term structural issues that might exist uh, to evidence higher prices for food and fuel and to help us understand what those might be and how they might be changing. Um, and second is to understand the short-term uh, measures that your companies are taking to help your customers in this particularly difficult time uh, with the cost of living crisis. Uh, before we get into questions, I should just say that we're delighted to welcome Sir Robert Goodwill, who's the chair of the DEFRA Select Committee, and Ian Byrne, who's a member of the DEFRA Select Committee, who are joining us uh, today. Um, so, to begin with, um, presumably all of your companies recognise that we're still in the midst of a cost of living crisis where a very significant number of your customers are unable to afford to buy the food uh, and fuel that they need uh, to support their households. I'm assuming everybody agrees with that. Um, and it was announced today that inflation has come down a little bit to around 8%. Um, but for the public, I think that translates as meaning that prices are still going up at a rate of 8%. Is that also right? Yeah. So customers are struggling and prices are still going up. So the question that many have been asking, including the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, the Competition and Markets Authority and others, is whether, and I'm quoting the government here, whether the supermarkets have been behaving or not in their pricing. Um, and one of the accusations is that um, all of your companies, I think for the exception of, with the exception of Morrison's, have been making increased profits, uh, and therefore have you been doing enough to keep down the prices of the food that you supply to your customers? So I just want to take that question head on, uh, and in the context of increased profits, are you doing enough to help? So uh, Gordon um, Gaffer for um, Tesco, are you doing enough to help your customers? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a, a, I would start by saying that um, at uh, Tesco at the moment, we are the most competitive we have ever been. Um, we have a real powerful combination, in our uh, opinion, uh, of uh, Aldi price match, for example, which we have recently expanded. And just to go into a little bit of detail what that means, we have 700 lines that we price match uh, every week to Aldi and customers, when they come to Tesco shops, are guaranteed that they will not pay anything more for those lines in Tesco. But that's just not, it's not the only thing we're doing. So for example, we have a low everyday prices campaign where we lock prices and that's over a thousand lines. In the majority of our uh, stores fixed for periods of um, um, three months, for example, and they cover all the market with regards to how we uh, price match. Uh, and finally, through club card prices, uh, you will have in any given week about uh, 8,000 prices where we go up to 50% promotions and uh, offer our club card holders real unbeatable value. Uh, I wanted to tackle the uh, profitability question head on. Uh, we have not made uh, more profit year on year. Uh, we have actually made 7% less profit uh, versus uh, our last financial year. Um, so I think it's important to be uh, clear at the outset on that point, Mr sure. Chairman. And maybe you can help me because you all run very complicated businesses. So I, I had a quick look at the annual accounts for each of your companies and specifically compared your performance before the COVID lockdowns to the last financial year because, of course, COVID made things much more difficult to understand. And, and, and to take Tesco as an example, according to your 2018-19 annual accounts, you made a profit of £1.6 billion. And in your 21-22 accounts, you made a profit of £2.03 billion. So just as a very basic review of the accounts, you've increased your profit quite significantly there, haven't you? I think if I, when I look at our group um, profits, we, we, are, we are a business made out of various companies, including retail, wholesale, uh, international business in, Czech, in, in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Ireland. Um, our profitability has hovered between 3 to 4 percent in the last um, four or five years, and I quote from our group accounts uh, since, since 2019. Um, and as I say, the profits year on year for the group, for the group business are, are down. Um, and uh, I would like to remind maybe the committee, just in the interest of um, transparency, we have 
sold more year on year. We have made less, and that is within, uh, which is public, public information. We have had a really big savings program at Tesco. We have saved 550 million pounds. We have given our colleagues 15% um, pay increase in the last year, 22% over the last couple of years uh, and if you do the maths I guess between what we sold and what we made it's a significant investment in our customer offer uh, as well as our colleagues which we're really quite proud of actually. Yes. I'm, and I'm sorry to cut in but the public will will just look at the numbers I've presented to you and your your group profits have gone up from before the Covid pandemic to now from 1.6 billion to 2.03 billion that's a bigger number. I'm sure there are lots of reasons underneath it, but essentially you, you've got more cash in the bank at the end of the day uh, based on your reported accounts. And so the question is, why, given the COVID pandemic, the energy crisis, the, the increase in cost for your supply, the increased cost to your customers, how can it be possible that you're making hundreds of millions of pounds in additional profit? I would reiterate the point, Mr. Chairman. I'm, around, uh, I'm looking at the numbers, our adjusted uh, operating profit for the group in 2019 were 2.6 and in 2023 they're 2.6 again so uh, there may be I don't know maybe some discrepancies in what we're comparing but I, as I, I need to move on but just so you know for the record this is the Tesco PLC annual report and financial statements from 2018 to 2019 where a chap called Alan Stewart who is your chief financial officer reported a group statutory profit before tax of uh, 1.6 billion pounds and then when I turn to the same report from 2022 is a different chap this time, but he reports on the same measure, 2.03 billion pounds. So I'm just reading the numbers I mean, from I'm, I'm referring to our latest uh, issued accounts for 2022-23, so that, that may be the discrepancy. I'm, I'm happy to, I guess, compare okay. notes outside. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Comerford, from uh, the perspective of ASDA, are you doing enough to help your customers right now? So in a, in a similar way to uh, what we've just discussed, so if you looked at the ASDA full year 2022, to account sales were flat uh, on a year-on-year -year basis, but profit at the adjusted EBITDA perspective was down by 25%. So that reflects what we've been trying to do to manage the inflation that we've been seeing. We all know the uh, drivers that we've seen of inflation in the, in the UK market, um, whether that's from some of the supply chain issues through the pandemic, whether the weak pound and uh, labour market costs, uh, the, the war in Ukraine certainly uh, affecting uh, food and energy prices out there. Um, we've done a, a series of uh, customer-facing uh, initiatives uh, with a launch of Just Essentials, which is our entry price range um, uh, in all of our stores. We have uh, done a dropped and locked campaign where we not only have dropped the prices of products, we've also held them for a period of time. Uh, we've launched a, a rewards program uh, and a, a loyalty pr a program so the more that you shop at asda the more you get rewarded uh, for that as well as investing in the in some of the key uh, food offers out there and in our cafes we we offer kids um, the chance to eat for one pound um, as uh, a lot of the my competitive set have also done we've also invested in our colleagues as well with a series of pay increases uh, uh, which has been necessary as we faced into this cost of living crisis. Thank you. And the ASDA accounts are quite difficult to read because you've had a significant change in the way that your business is owned and financed. One of the things I've noticed is that your cost of borrowing has gone from in 2018-2019 from £66 million to the year 2122 uh, to nearly half a billion pounds. Why have your debt payments had to go up so significantly and what does that mean for your customers? So as you say, we've had an ownership change during that time period um, and therefore as a consequence the way we are, are owned and are structured is different. So as you were comparing um, three, three years prior to that. All I would say is therefore that bit has then been factored in as we've looked to um, our business and our account and therefore despite that as what you're talking to in terms of the uh, financial structure we're still investing in the customer offer that's why we have invested in just, uh, just essentials um, as rewards dropped a lot programs as well as uh, cafes for our customers. Uh, Rianne Bartlett coming to you next from a, a Sainsbury's perspective again the same question I've just looked at the annual accounts 2018-19, there was profit before tax of £239 million, 21-22, £854 million. There's been a significant increase in profit at Sainsbury's. Are you doing enough to help your customers? So, 
The first thing we would like to say is we're acutely aware of the impact of the cost of living crisis on our customers and also on our colleagues and how difficult that they're all finding it right now. Uh, We've spent £560 million on keeping prices low, um, battling inflation, and we're doing absolutely everything we can uh, to keep prices as low for customers as possible. Uh, like uh, Tesco and Asda, we have a range of price um, mechanics and activations that we um, choose to invest in um, to help our customers. So we also have an Aldi price match um, offer we have about 300 products in that. They're the products our customers buy the most frequently. We've been very choiceful about making sure that that's covering a set of products that are in their baskets week in, week out. We also have price lock and we have loyalty pricing. And in addition to that, we have an economy range called Stamford Street. And we've just brought all of our lowest priced products under one brand so that they're really easy to find. In terms of the accounts that you reference, um, actually our most recent year that we've just published, we made 690 million. So our um, input costs are not being fully passed through to our shelf prices. We've submitted lots of detail on that to the CMA. We've had very good discussions and dialogue with the CMA. Um, but we are inflating behind our input costs and we're inflating wherever possible behind the market. Thank you. Um, and, and David Potts from Morrison's, I suppose the saving grace is your profit's gone down, not up, uh, from 2018-19 compared to 21-22. So I can't, can't quite put the same question to you that you're running away with excess profits, but what are you doing to help your customers with the cost of living crisis? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I think it's a privilege uh, for Morrison's and I'm very pleased to be here uh, in person myself. I think we are acutely aware of the pressure that many millions of you know, ordinary people have come under as a result of this cost of living crisis and food inflation in particular. I know that since it started, we have donated four million to food banks to make sure no one is left behind in that same period. We've helped our customers by collecting the goods they want to donate to food banks and, and delivering them there ourselves. A further eight million, and that does come on top of the 12 million that I know members of the select committee will be aware. We donated from the company during the pandemic to food banks. I think as far as what have we done this year, well, so far I reported on Thursday our profits were down 10% half year one um, as we faced into lower prices. By investing early in lower prices, we are as close now as this company has ever been to, to Aldi and Lidl prices. Um, and my, I think, final remark would be we have introduced <coughs> a, a, a brand called Savers, which according to Kantar last week, who comment on the industry on various matters, is the fastest growing sort of fighter brand, the budget brand in the UK uh, this year. And I believe that's because we've lowered prices with a tougher policy for us to get through with those prices of Savers. We've made delivery uh, more attractive, and we've increased the item count to 240 for of that items, and we've put them where people can see them uh, and buy them. And so I think it's a very fair question, and there's more we can do, but I'm very confident that so far we're getting at every cost we can in order to put it into prices. Thank you. And then just very lastly from me, um, all of you are very large employers, as well as serving very significant numbers of consumers. Um, and I heard recently, specifically there are Asda employees, but I'm sure it applies in other supermarkets, of employees having to go to the food bank to pick up the free donations of food they'd stacked in their own supermarket because they can't make ends meet. So I just want to ask each of you very quickly whether you're a living wage employer. Um, uh, Gordon? Uh, we are. As I said, we are really quite proud to have given um, a 15% increase to our colleagues. Uh, I, 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 would, I would like... I, I just, I'm conscious of time, so it's just a short answer. Are you a living yes. wage employer, yes or no? We are a real, uh, real living wage employer, yes. Thank you. Chris yes. Asda, you yeah. are. Rian yes. Sainsbury, David Morrison. National living wage, 10.42. We're paying 10.92 with a 15% discount. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to move on because I'm conscious of time. Um, we're going to go now into fuel prices and then food prices um, and dive into some of these issues in a bit more detail. Um, so, Anthony Magnol, please, on fuel prices. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to start with um, you, Mr. Gaffer, because I think Tesco's has got the most number of fuel courts out of the panellists uh, with us today. Um, can you just give us an idea as to what has caused uh, f the increase in fuel uh, prices, um, both from outside and within your control? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Um, Magnal. Um, f fuel prices have um, seen a significant increase driven by uh, the impact of the uh, unfortunate war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we shouldn't uh, forget that more than 90% of uh, the price that you see at the pump is actually made of uh, input costs, um, taxes, as well as uh, duties. Uh, and the significant spike in the prices that you saw at the pumps uh, was largely driven by factors uh, outside uh, of our control. And, and in terms of what is within your control, because you have huge purchasing power, you can buy in a wholesale manner, and yet prices have remained stubbornly high across actually all four of your fuel, all four of your company's fuel courts have very, very high prices and continue to do so. So, you know, what is what is within your purchasing power to actually reduce those prices? Um, it, it, it's probably important to point out that prices have reduced very significantly. I would say. Um, if we compare from January till now, I believe the current average is around 16 pence per litre cheaper uh, than what it was at the time. And uh, again, versus the peaks that we saw last year, uh, from memory again, we're about 28% uh, cheaper uh, at the pumps for, for motorists. Uh, we do um, buy from eight different suppliers. We uplift from over 30 different locations. Uh, and we're quite proud of, of uh, how we buy and uh, how we, we make sure that uh, what is within our control, which is fairly limited, I would say, because you have to refer to the plots price on, on, on fuel as the key input uh, raw material. And that significant chunk of um, that, that price is um, duty and tax. Um, in fact, 53 pence per litre is, is, is still duty, plus you have... Uh, VAT at 20% uh, on, on top. I mean, I, I don't take much comfort in the fact that you're saying that the prices are down from a very, very high level in the first instance. I think consumers are wondering why they still remain incredibly high. And I think there is also huge concern around transparency within the sector. Um, I know Mr. Gullis will come on to this, but actually take Northern Ireland as an example, where there is greater transparency around fuel prices. <coughs> and the RAC is reporting that actually there's a significantly lower price offered to consumers as a result. Can I ask you, I'll start with you, Ms. Gaffer, because I'm sorry, I'm focusing on you, but I will come, into other, uh, come to others in a second. But what consideration have you had about actually enhancing that transparency, either in real terms or going on to a Northern Ireland model, where it's a weekly presentation of your figures, which has actually seen significantly reduced prices offered to consumers? And also, given the fact that that actually beats any of the, com any of the points that you've just made around you know, how you're purchasing and what you're doing, because mm -hmm. they've been able to keep it consistently low through the pandemic and through the fuel crisis. As well. Um, uh, first and foremost, I, I start by saying that we, we do um, compete locally and our pricing policy is structured to compete uh, locally and we're um, you know, really keen to make sure that we, we stick with it. Um, uh, we, we are a retailer in Northern Ireland, we have 19 sites, uh, so we are part of Northern Ireland and how we deliver uh, fuel, fuel to, to motorists. Uh, over there. Sorry, can I just jump in there? So, um, w can you can you give me a comparison right now for what you're charging for petrol and diesel in Northern Ireland versus what you'd be charging in England? Because presumably you're part of that transparency it, it, system. So, as I say, we, we, we do uh, price locally, uh, and within the Tesco policy, we have a spread of about 10 pence per litre, uh, which we try not to deviate from. Let's not forget fuel pricing is very volatile uh, and at any one point you could have locations that would be within that spread. Um, on, on your question specifically around transparency, uh, I would like to remind the community we, we do um, put our fuel prices outside each of our locations, we display them on big screens and we're very open before you drive into a Tesco versus maybe one of our competitors. Yeah. Well, and, and just to answer specifically the question, 
on, on transparency. We would welcome more transparency on price and fuel. We have no objection w w whatsoever to, to transparent prices. In fact, we would welcome the system that is in Northern Ireland, where you can go online and compare. It's, it is not, 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 not something I, we would I, be against. I mean, I just make the point. I don't think it offers people much comfort to say you're advertising what the price is outside when they have very yeah, little options to, to be able to get. You know, well, precisely as Ms. Mm -hmm. says, which you have to show those prices. But if you have little alternative, it makes no difference. I think the, I think the consideration has to be how do you ensure that you collectively, given the fact that you are the biggest fuel core owners or one of the biggest groups of fuel core owners are actually competing at a price that is fair and reasonable to consumers. Yeah. And, and fair and reasonable pricing is at the heart of, of the Tesco operation. Um, just in terms of options, Tesco has 511 petrol fuel stations out of about 8,300 in the UK. So market share with regards to sites is about 6%. But actual share with regards to volume is 16%. Uh, and, and we think because we have busy sites and convenient locations that are competitively priced, motorists do reward us with their business. I mean, I'm going to thank you very much for your responses. You. I'm going to just quickly ask you, if I may, Chair, would all of you collectively be happy to enter into a model that is absolutely uh, akin to what's being done in Northern Ireland? Sorry, Mr. Gallus, I'm stealing a lot of your, your points. But um, would you all be happy to enter into a system that would actually provide better live price fuel, uh, fuel price transparency? Um, Comfort. It's a yes or no would be very helpful in terms of time, and I will come back. Okay, in which case, then yes, absolutely. Yes. I think anything that can benefit consumers, we'd be happy to look at. We certainly have some work to do then on our side on this. Can I, can I come to you, Ms. Butler, which is what are you expecting to actually, in terms of bring down uh, prices and create more sort of price stability within your market and what you're able to offer consumers? Yeah, so um, pricing today has actually returned to pre-Russia-Ukraine um, war pricing. So that's a good thing. We've been through a year, um, a year and a bit of very deep instability in supply, um, which you will have seen. And that has stabilised over the last number of weeks and months. And so we, we now sit at 140, 140, around that level, uh, which could be compared to more n normal levels. Um, the way that we price petrol is also locally, that's how the market operates, and we aim to be the cheapest or the second cheapest in all the catchments that we operate in. <coughs> we run out of about 300 catchments, and again, as, you, as you're aware, the CMA have been looking in a great deal of detail at this market. It's been a very productive process. We've engaged closely with them. Um, they haven't found particular competition concerns, although they are publishing um, a fuller report next week. But what they have found is the presence of a supermarket in a catchment it actually helps to keep prices low. So I think if they um, recommend an open data platform like the one you refer to, we'd be very supportive um, of something like that. Listen, I, I mean, I, you've mentioned the CMA, and I'm in danger of wandering into the next question, so I won't do that. But I can, can I just make the point that the CMA said that actually, from a supermarket perspective, that you, you know you collectively had been very bad um, at providing information. I make that point just that you can do better on that. Um, I've, I've steered into Mr. Gallus's territory, so I'll hand over to him. And, and, and just to be clear, I don't think the CMA named which of your businesses had not been forthcoming in engaging with their market study. Mm. I suspect they, they might do next week, but just to be clear, I don't know which one of you it is that's not playing ball with the CMA, but uh, Jonathan Collins. Thank you, Chair. And to follow on from Mr Mangle's point, I mean, uh, to be perfectly transparent, I'm someone who supports and has worked with Fair Fuel UK, who's been calling for this pump watch introduction, similar to what we see in Northern Ireland. So I'm very delighted to hear that we have all the major, uh, the 44% uh, forecourt share essentially in the road fuels market space now supporting this campaign. And that would be good news for the Chancellor, who I know has been engaging with the Department of Business and Trade and others to hear their views on this matter. The chart, you know, this government since 2010 has frozen fuel duty for over a decade. We've seen two cuts to uh, the actual cost. And we saw the Chancellor having uh, worked with myself and the Sun newspaper campaign for uh, the 5p cut to remain in place. Yet, sadly, consumers don't believe for a single second that that cut in fuel duty has ever been passed on 
to the consumer because ultimately these stubbornly high prices, particularly for diesel drivers, has meant that they feel that they're being taken advantage of. And the Competition and Markets Authority themselves have said that between 2017 and 2022, the profit margin for supermarkets in fuel has gone from, was doubled from 4% to 8%. Do you think what the CMA says said there is reflective of what you're seeing within your businesses and do you see, or can you explain, why customers didn't see that 5p cut in fuel duty and the continuation of that scheme passed on into their pockets? If I start with uh, you, Mr Potts. The duty, we did uh, pass that on the same day. And um, clearly, the volatility within the market has to be tracked over time, I think. Um, we have provided everything that the CMA has asked for uh, and would continue to do so. Um, I think there is a bit more profit actually at the retail end of fuel. Uh, I couldn't be specific on the timescales, but if that is roughly eight, I, I'm going to go away from this meeting inspired to have a look at the 92. Mm. And three things we've done this year for consumers on fuel, we've added more card points to every litre of fuel our consumers, our customers buy, forgive me. We've run three promotions on our fuel which would have lasted nine weeks, uh, which I know has helped. And we've strengthened our pricing policy within that local catchment, so it's actually tougher for us to hit that price policy within the spreads. Um, I, I, look, I, think, I think we can always do more. The energy costs that exist, the transport costs, the labour costs within our sites, they all have added uh, to the dollar pound, to the oil barrel, uh, post, post Russia and, and so on. So, you know, if, if, if I may just for one moment go right back, I do think over four decades the British supermarkets have brought lower prices to consumers in Britain for fuel. These are facts. And right now, the fuel prices on our supermarket forecourts are lower than the independents and, and continue, continue well, of course, to be so. Uh, to go back to Mr Mangle's point, you will be able to have a better purchasing power than an independent forecourt, which will be able to therefore drive down those costs. And my concern is that the Competition and Markets Authority basically gave a slap on the wrist to the supermarkets over uh, fuel prices. And within two weeks of the Competition Market Authority giving a uh, tell it ticking off to the supermarkets. Suddenly, <clears throat> by some miracle, we saw four court price on average come down by 7p per litre. So it took naming and shaming for the Competition and Markets Authority for dramatically 7p overnight to be found off your margins. Why was it, in that case, that that 7p was not passed on prior to the Competition and Markets Authority making any statement? If I come to you, sorry again, Mr Potts, that's okay. Of course. Well, I think it's a very, a very fair question, but the, um, if I take the exact same day last year as today, we are about 48p a litre lower. And so the seven, I'm sure, is in there somewhere with the five. But I, I, I think I, I would only be repeating myself in the interest of time. I, 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 no, I appreciate Mr Potts, because Mr Comerford, as they used to be a market leader and having a loss leader at the pump in order to build brand loyalty and bring people into the store, as it seems to have abandoned that policy of being a loss leader and actually has gone for the more profiteering route, which is why people feel that essentially, I'm not going to take a word I know Miss Hunt's going to use later, but a, a, a feeling that there's a collective group think here in this space that's meaning that we're not seeing competition in the market space as there once was. Why did ASDA abandon that halo, I think, effect it was referred to as the, by the Competition Market Authority? Why did it abandon the loss leader at the pump to build the brand loyalty with the store? The ASDA uh, fuel pricing uh, strategy policy hasn't changed um, over many years, right? We are still uh, recognised, as the CMA have said, that we're still recognised as the best value uh, fuel provider. Does that mean ASDA is still a loss leader in fuel? So the, the uh, overall strategy of us to be the best value fuel, uh, fuel retailer in the UK has not changed. You wouldn't have what? seen profit margins go from 4 to 8%. We, have, we look at everything in its total round. As was said earlier, our full year profits in 2022 for the total as to which is food, fuel, and the total business have dropped by 25% off a back, back, um, background of a sales line being flat. 
So we, we, don't, we look at everything in its total entirety. You are also having to pay whopping debt back, as uh, Mr. the chair, Mr. Jones, pointed out, because the fact that you had a new buyer come into the company only put £800 million of their own money, therefore heavily debt-laden the business, which is why we're now seeing nearly half a billion pounds of debt being resurfaced. So essentially, you would have had to have made more money in order to be able to service the debt, because the debt deal, from what I understand, was the market rate at 5% plus an additional 6%, so 11% interest rate on the debt that you're paying. Would that not therefore lead to the fact that that's why reality is, whilst you may still remain the most competitive, it is not far off, it's no longer the loss leader it was to build and bring the customer into the store for Asda, and therefore you are probably making double profit margins, as the CMA has suggested. As I said in my opening statement, the, the ownership structure hasn't changed the uh, business decision to invest in customers. Therefore, we have invested in, in as we said, in the food elements of just essentials, uh, of Asda rewards and, and, and kids eat for a pound. And, and you know, it's recognised by the CMA that we are still the best value food, uh, fuel provider. That has uh, remained unchanged. Can I check, Mr Comfort, you're not the company that the CMA has referred to as, quote, at least one supermarket has significantly increased its internal forward-looking margin target since 2019. That wouldn't apply to Asda. I haven't gone through the full details of the CMA <coughs> report. It's due out, I believe, in the next few weeks uh, with recommendations, and we will review those recommendations accordingly um, and, and uh, implement any recommendations that come forward. And if we as a committee request internal documents from you, would, you, would we find evidence of this, or would you be willing to share those documents? If you, I'm sorry, I missed that bit. If, you want to if we as a committee ask the internal documents, would we find evidence of All this? of our documents have been uh, submitted. The CMA have everything. We have fully engaged with them <coughs> on everything. I have been to the CMA. We've had the conversations. They have all of our documentation. If I come to uh, yourself, Ms Bartlett, and, then I'll, um, and Mr Gaffer, on the 27th of March 2023, the CMA noted that the average diesel retail margins were more than three times the size of average petrol retail margins at over 23 pence per litre compared to 7 pence per litre. I'm, I say this obviously refer to my interest on someone who drives a diesel car, Chair, so I'll sort of put that on the record. But do these margins, do these figures align with your own or have your margins come down since? If I start with you, Ms. Bartlett, then you, Mr. Gaffer. So, pricing today, as I said earlier, is 141 and 140. So, whilst, we, you know, in this kind of format, I can't comment specifically on margins for individual products, so I wouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, what, we, um, what we have seen through a very volatile period is finally st some stability. So wholesale prices have been highly volatile, supply has been highly volatile. It's been one of the most difficult years, I would say, to operate in this market. It's also a market that's in steep decline, so volumes are reducing as people electrify their vehicles. Um, and so we are managing um, a situation for customers as best as we possibly can, trying to keep prices as low as we possibly can, which is what we have always done. We've always had the same pricing policy to match at the local catchment area. Um, there was a period of time where diesel and petrol prices were further apart than they've historically been, and that, that was fairly short-lived. You say about electrification, Ms Bartlett, coming down the track. So what's the plan? If more and more people electrify, will is the long-term plan that four courts will disappear from we, supermarkets we, or are we going to keep prices high to actually make up for the loss in customers who will charge at home? We've committed to providing petrol for our customers as long as they need it and as long as we possibly can. But clearly, in parallel with that, we'll be starting to think about how can we provide an EV infrastructure um, because that's where all the new demand will be. Mr Gaffer, sorry, if I come to you as well, please. On the first question, which is obviously about uh, the uh, margin on diesel reportedly now being around 23 pence per litre compared to 7 pence per litre. Does that match with what Tesco is seeing? Uh, not, not at the moment. I think, as, as, um, as I said earlier, we, we, we do price um, in each and every local area, and we do look every day at 8,000 sites and make sure that um, we are competitive. I actually want to say specifically on diesel, um, we did step out of our price policy and we believe to have let the market down to make sure that we gave, uh, as soon as we were confident that the volatility which we have experienced, which has been really quite tremendous in, uh, in uh, petrol pricing, 
as soon as we were confident we could do so, we went and led out um, and uh, reduced prices uh, outside of our policy pretty quickly to make sure that we could return value. You would, you would disagree with the CMA, who in May said that they felt diesel prices, quote, remain elevated, end quote, even though wholesale prices of diesel have been falling since the start of 2023. In, in any particular week, there will be volatility and there will be variations. The important, it's important to look at the return that we make on fuel over a year. Um, and as a Tesco business, as I said earlier, four pence in every pound is what Tesco makes from, uh, from, from our operations. Uh, there will be volatility even up to, in its peak, it was even up to 10 pence per litre per week that we were seeing, uh, which is quite, was quite significant and very difficult to deal with, to be honest. Because, Chair, before I, just my last point before I surrender my time is just that my concern is that the Chair has clearly pointed out from the accounts that profits have gone up to above what they were pre-pandemic levels overall before tax. And you're all saying it's not coming from the stores with people buying food. So therefore, it must be coming from the fuel court. Because otherwise, I don't really see how, in Tesco's case, you're making £400 million more pre-tax in 21, 22, I think it was, Chair, you referred to, compared to 18, 19. It just leaves me baffled, but I'll hand over to you, Chair. We'll have to keep that as a comment, not a question, I'm afraid, because of time. Uh, just very lastly, Mark Pawsey, and then we'll come to food prices. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to go uh, stick with the CMA. Uh, report if I may. Um, do each of you agree with the assertion of the um, CMA yes. that there is evidence of retailer margins increasing on fuel over the last four years? That was evidence that the CMA gave before this committee only a couple of weeks ago. Do, do you agree with the CMA, uh, Mr <coughs> Gaffer? We, we are one of the retailers that has really collaborated. collaborated. Uh, Mr Gaffer, have the CMA got it right or got it wrong? As one of the retailers that has extensively collaborated with the CMA, that would be representative of what we have seen, yes. Oh, sorry, is that a yes or no? Yes. I, I, you, have the CMA got it right or got it wrong when they uh, say that retailer uh, margins have increased? I, if you allow me, I, I can't comment specically because we are in a panel. Let's move on to Mr Comerford. Are the CMA right or wrong, sir? The CMA have all the information. We've shared everything with them. I, all that we're keen to see is the reports, uh, the output of their study, which will be out in a few weeks' time. They're, so they're wrong in suggesting that there's evidence of increasing retailer margins? I haven't seen the report okay. yet. Uh, Ms Barlett, are the CMA right or wrong? I don't know what other retailer margins are, which is absolutely as it should be. So Your retailer margins are in change. We will need to wait for the report. So the CMA out. are wrong, in your view, in, the, in their assertion that there, are, uh, there is evidence of rising retailer margins. The CMA are the only ones that can see all of the information, so we need to wait for them to... So you accept back. what they're saying? Where, 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 yeah, when they come back, uh, Mr. we will Potts, absolutely uh, where, where are you on what the what CMA say. are saying? Well, despite it being the lowest margin category in the store... I, as I said earlier, I think to a colleague, forgive me, um, I think there is a bit more profit on okay. fuel in the. So the CMA have got it right. Correct. Brilliant. Okay. And one of the things CMA want to see is more competition in the sector. And they're talking about perhaps, you, uh, you know, you've already told us about putting the price on uh, the forecourt, which I think is an obligation anyway. But how about things like uh, readily providing your information to apps? so that uh, consumers can determine where the lowest price is. I mean, would anybody take an initiative on, a, on something such as that? Mr Garka. Yeah, as, I said, um, as I said earlier, we, we, we welcome, honestly, uh, price transparency in the sector. And if we need to submit um, information in an app or a website like that is in Northern Ireland, we would be happy to do so. And have you got any other ideas as to how the market can, consumers can know more, how the prices can be made more competitive? I think digitisation and app and usage of and the pricing being visible online, is, it happens in food retail now where when we have strong promotions, I'll give you a very practical example, Hot Deals UK will show that promotion and customers vote for it as really something that they like. And we welcome that because it shows to customers online where there is good value in the market. Okay. Any of the other old witnesses got any suggestions as to how we can communicate more effectively prices to uh, consumers so that we get better competition mm. in the sector? I think the, the proposal is uh, an open data app that includes drive times and the potential cost of travelling to any particular location if you put your reg in. And we'd be very supportive of that kind of initiative. And Mr Potts, would you support that initiative? Well, consumers are very savvy. I've not seen that change. Um, and, and I think I said earlier, we, we're very happy to look at anything that drives a better deal for consumers, including fuel. 
Mr Comerford, would you also make your data available to an app so that consumers can know where the cheapest fuel is in their area? Yes, definitely, right. because they can make the right choices and decide when they're on their journey. Excellent. Why wouldn't we help? Thank you. Uh, just a health warning to colleagues. Um, I've got a maximum of 45 minutes and 10 uh, people to call, so please try to keep your questions focused. And witnesses, please try to keep your answers straight uh, so that we can um, get through it. Uh, Jane Hunt, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm on to food pricing inflation, please. So food pricing inflation rose to over 19% in March this year, the highest rise in food prices since 1978. To what extent have food prices been hit and which ones have been worst hit and why? Shall I stop Mr Potts, please? Oh, let me just move across. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, we've certainly seen eggs, if I give a specific example, and, and, and a why, the avian flu. As I understand it, um, it the, we lost 420 million birds uh, around the world, and therefore, you know, the the protein itself, the the, the meat itself, and the eggs, uh, particularly the eggs, have become in a short supply. Okay, um, just on that point, Mr. Potts. Um, a, a producer has told me that their prices have only increased by 14% and they have passed those on accordingly, just that, no extra. And yet we see in our notes that actually egg prices have gone up by 29%. What do you say to that? Well, absent of the detail, I think eggs have actually gone up a lot more than both those, if I may, if I may put it that way, and uh, we know how important they are. I think... Um, they have started to build the flocks and the eggs are starting to come through across the whole of the UK, actually, including Northern Ireland. Um, and so I, I am hopeful and I expecting to see uh, a gradual normalising of the egg price. I think the other example would be pork, where a, a sort of almost an oversupply of pigs led to a sort of reduction in the rearing and the finishing of pigs. Uh, across the world uh, just at a time when sort of demand uh, was going up and that has put what is relatively a cheap meat, a very important protein, of course, uh, put, put that under pricing pressure. Okay, uh, thank year. you Mr Potts, forgive me, we're under uh, time pressure. Uh, Ms Bartlett, not eggs, not pork, what, what others? Yeah, so the, the, the big pressures on inflation have been a combination of wages and labour energy and then commodity costs moving around and the way that we've seen that coming through the system is in kind of fresh and chilled food it comes through much faster and in packaged and long life food it takes a little bit longer so um, we've seen prices increase the most and the fastest in produce and in meat fish and poultry um, alongside that there are other pressures in the system, such as the ones that David refers to, um, where we've got agriculture pressures. Um, but the core um, drivers of inflation have been labour, energy, and then commodities, which are relatively cyclical. We're seeing prices, some of those fresh food prices that I talked about, start to, the commodity price start to ease. So we've started to see some prices come down, so you'll probably have seen media about milk, about bread, butter, yes, cheese. I'll, I'll come on to that actually in, in just a moment. Yeah. Forgive me for interrupting you, Mr. Comerford. Any comment? Exactly, similar to those. Uh, obviously, we saw in um, in February as well some salad shortages. Um, so, therefore, it just shows some of the fragility in okay, the. Okay, so the price the, increases are due to shortages. There was an element of that on some of the other produce stuff. There's some structural challenges, and then, as we said before, that anything that requires energy, um, you know, la labour markets, all of these things. That's uh, well, that's why we've seen some global commodity challenges on the rest of it. Thank you. Mr Gaffer, anything to add on that point? Yeah, I just wanted to build on um, uh, Ms Bartlett's point, uh, particularly maybe uh, spending a minute on uh, the role of on-label in the UK. Uh, we are, uh, as Tesco, quite proud that 50% of what we sell is actually retailer-branded. And that is one of the most developed on-label markets in the world. It, I underline that point because it offers a real unique tool in the UK for customers to manage uh, their weekly budget. And if you think of own label, par particularly because we have invested, uh, I'm quite proud personally to have led it when I joined Tesco, a lot of time building open book cost models on own label, 
with long-term contracts that give transparency, you tend to see inflation in commodities flow through fairly quickly because there is nowhere to go. But actually, and you can see some of those changes in milk and bread, as cereals start to decline and the farm gate milk price starts to decline, you see those coming back and signs of inflation, food inflation easing are clear okay. uh, for us to see. Thank you very much, Mr Gafford. Thank you. But both of you managed to cover off two of my next two questions, really, which I'll just roll into one. So UN Food and Agriculture Organisation, the FAO, um, food price index shows that the price of various commodities, oils, cereals, dairy and meat, has fallen since last summer, and yet those prices don't to, seem to have been reduced in the supermarkets. And which says uh, that own brand budget items have risen by 25%. So the ones you're referring to and the ones that Asda referred to earlier on increased by 25% compared to, compared to the previous year. Each one of you, as you've spoken to my colleagues earlier on, have talked about Aldi price match meeting the Aldi prices. Is this, in fact, pegging prices? Hmm. Mr Gaffer. Um, it is not pegging prices. It's Aldi is a German retailer that has got very competitive prices. We have grown the coverage of Aldi at uh, Aldi price match, a significant uh, investment. Um, I think it's important to just to go back on the FAO point and the price food price index. There are degrees, varying degrees of inflation. Some of it is more sticky than others. So the labour cost increases that are in Tesco, that are in our competitors, that are in our supply base, don't tend to go away. So there is some fairly structural inflation that is still in the system and doesn't tend to change as quickly as the more transitory inflation that you see in the, some of the commodities that we've described. Uh, on that point, I, I'm really quite pleased that we've led out on milk, we've led out on cooking oils, some flour oil, that, that had an exponential impact driven by the Ukraine war. 60% of the sunflower crop in the world comes out of Ukraine. And we had to really fight hard for customers to secure the availability, pay more, but now that actually the situation has eased and more sunflower is coming out, you can see, and we've gone down, and we hope to do more as more of that transitory deflation comes through or reduced inflation comes Thank through. Thank you, Mr Gaffer. So, uh, Mr Comerford, I'm a capitalist in a free market economy, uh, but is this actually free? It is what free? Mark, the pricing market within the supermarkets. There are a small number of you. In 1978, there were many, many more supermarkets. I remember because I was that. I'm that old. I was around at the time. There are very few supermarkets now, and you each talk about Aldi. Are you in fact a cartel? The UK retail market is the most competitive market. I've worked in Central Europe. I've worked in Asia as to some of uh, my competitive set. And this is strange today, but alongside a table who I compete against on a day by day, my teams compete against. We are trying to drive, do our best customer offer to grow our market share. This is quite a, uh, a, a unique uh, um, opportunity or situation that myself and, uh, and my uh, peers find ourselves in today. We're absolutely not. We are driven by growing our business by being uh, for our customers. We have transparency insofar as we can see the prices that our competitive sets sell to their products on a, on a daily basis, either through the internet or in the stores. So that's what drives us and that's what motivates us. And, and as um, uh, uh, Mr. Potts said earlier, customers are really savvy. They absolutely will, will make decisions to who they shop to um, based on the pricing. So it's on the, the onus is on us to be the best value. Apologies. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to need to move on, I'm afraid. Okay, I'm so sorry. Fine, thank you. Um, Ian Lavery, please. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Shia. It's been described by Sharon Graham, the uh, General Secretary of the United Union, that uh, the, the biggest supermarkets in the UK are engaged in, and I'll, I'll quote, grotesque display of profiteering at this time at a time when millions of workers are struggling simply to put food on the table. What do you say to that? Just very, very briefly. Uh, as I said before, we, we make, and this is the whole group, four pence in every pound, um, which I don't think is a, a any example of Profiteering. We really, without customers and without their trade, there is no Tesco. Um, and we have doubled down on our competitiveness. And genuinely, as we've said recently in our quarterly update, 
We are the most competitive we have ever been. We monitor our, our prices weekly. I get a price index against the whole market, and it's the strongest it has been. A significant investment for colleagues, for customers, and working collaboratively with suppliers. A 25% reduction in our full year profitability in 2022 wouldn't dictate or reflect that comment that you've just shared with me. Uh, so we make less than three pence in the pound. Uh, we've also seen profits step back. And as I said earlier, the input cost pressures that we've had have not been reflected in full shelf edge prices. So we're doing absolutely everything we can. We really understand how much customers and also colleagues are struggling through this crisis. We're doing absolutely everything we can to make sure that we're helping them. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I, I agree with you that the most important thing we can do for consumers right now is to find ways to lower prices. Um, and um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not seeing any evidence that the industry is less uh, competitive than, than it ever was. Um, and I think the answers earlier to profitability probably underline that, actually. I mean, I'll come on later, um, later on this morning with regard to the um, the, 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 the the profits. Um, so I'm not I'm not like asking any questions on that as much. I find it absolutely staggering, um, but but I will come on to that uh, later on this morning. At a time you know when we've got more children living in poverty, uh, an increase in my region of fifty thousand. Um, last year, um, and we've got the Food Foundation said that in the last 12 months to January 23, food security for children doubled. Um, to think that uh, the, the top supermarkets <coughs> feel as if they're doing the right thing, quite frankly, uh, is really concerning. Is profit and risk in the supply chain fairly shared by? Uh, the food producers, processors, and super, uh, supermarkets, particularly in a, a high inflationary environment and following external shocks such as major weather events or wars? So, um, we, we sell both branded items as well as um, own, own label items. And as I said earlier, on label, we tend to have longer term contracts, particularly in fresh foods, that um, really work on pricing collaboratively with our suppliers. Um, and I, I want to go back to, for example, the point on eggs. We have paid 28 million more in support um, to the egg industry last year. Uh, as Mr. Potts said, we have supported the pork industry as well. So it, it, I'm quite proud being in Tesco that for the seventh year running the Advantage survey, which is an industry survey, has placed Tesco first with regards to uh, supplier satisfaction about uh, working with us. It's not, not easy, um, but I am quite proud of that because it signifies uh, how we want to work with our suppliers and how we do work with our suppliers. Yeah, so look, well, our relationship, and I believe we have positive working relationships with our suppliers. I've known them over a long period of time. Um, we uh, work with them, we review their costs, we review where they're seeing commodities in a similar way. Um, our relationship is also very closely um, regulated, quite rightly, by the grocery code adjudicator, who I believe you're uh, <coughs> seeing shortly. Um, and therefore, we work with them, and they have, know they have a vehicle to talk to. If they um, don't share things with the or with uh, retailers, they have another <coughs> uh, vehicle, another route through as well. Thanks. Can I ask you another very brief question? In the, the like the tech, Tesco Express, Sainsbury's local, etc., the, the like the satellite supermarkets, um, do you sell your your own brand, uh, or do you sell your own brand plus saver uh, items uh, in the in these type of outlets? The start of the. Um, well, we're new to that game, and uh, convenience stores having just taken the calls out of administration, we're just busily. Uh, rescuing those jobs in that business, so I'm very happy to look at uh, whether we can get, particularly in this moment of high food inflation, whether we can get some of those sort of fighter brands that I described earlier. So you're not, you're not the, putting the, the, you're not well, putting the same we, up. We just take, we, we weren't in that section. If I just, 
spend one few seconds, I want to just make one point, which was your earlier question. Um, we, despite being the smaller company on this panel, we are British farming's biggest single yeah. supermarket customer. And we are, I believe, the second biggest food maker in Britain, despite being the smaller supermarket chain. So we believe very strongly in British food security, which is why we only stock 100% British food coming from beef, pork, and lamb. I, ju I just thought that point ought to be made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh. You're welcome. Um, to answer your point on, on risk and reward, we work very closely with our own brand suppliers. So in many instances, we have open book cost models. Um, and that's one of the reasons why inflation moves more quickly, inflation and deflation, when you operate that kind of model, because the retailer shares and takes lots of the commodity and labor energy pricing risk. Um, that's not the model with brands, as you would expect. So with brands, um, we've got no transparency, really, about uh, what their input costs are. Um, and so it's a different kind of conversation. To the question on um, convenience stores and how we range them and what we stock in convenience stores. So there's lots of own brand in convenience stores. Um, there isn't as much of the economy brand, which is what, what I think you were referring to. Most of our convenience stores are in city centres and they serve a lunchtime mission or a um, dinner for tonight mission. So we have 30,000 products in our big supermarkets. We have five or 6,000 in a convenience store. And so we're very constrained on space. So we range for the mission that the customer is shopping that store for. Most customers do their full shop in a supermarket and not in a convenience store. Okay. It, it, it a couple of just brief questions to Mr. Comerford. I think we'll all agree, I hope we'll all agree, that uh, during the pandemic, the fantastic employees uh, of all the top supermarkets, um, you know, the heroic efforts of the employees were, were well applauded uh, and deserve credit then and they deserve credit now. I mean, if it wasn't for these employees in, in your supermarkets, you wouldn't be making these these huge profits. But a question to Mr. Comerford. Um, it appears that as they are still using fire and rehire, uh, they're doing it, I believe, in the southeast and pours a 60 pence per day uh, pay cut uh, on 7,000 retail workers. Um, is that right? The fire and rehire tactics are not something that ASDA employs, it absolutely isn't. What you are, I believe, referring to is a historical supplement uh, that was paid into a small number of stores. So therefore, as a result, there was an anomaly where some ASDA uh, colleagues were paid a different rate to ones in an adjacent area. What we've chosen to do to, to fix it is look at our total business and therefore reward an 8% pay increase to the total hourly paid colleagues last year, followed by a further 10% this year. Are you using fire and rehire tactics? Absolutely not. Definitely not? Absolutely not. Right, okay, that's fine. And then in, another brief question, it, again it refers to, to ASDA. Mr. Comerford, is with regard to the fact that uh, ASDA are currently in the, the largest equal pay claim uh, in the private sector ever, with over 50,000 claimants currently suing ASDA for equal pay. There's a huge difference between the, the, the retail and the warehouse uh, workers, and in the main, women, it's women who are working in retail and men who are working in the warehouse and there's a discrepancy of at least three pound an hour which is an absolute fortune now next and other organizations have been through the tribunal hearings and it's been in the favor of the workers now the, the reality is is that uh, i believe that um as they have a hearing coming up on the, the 20 uh in september 2024 uh, if that's the case, if you lose that, it means that you're going to have to pay millions, if not billions of pounds of money back to the workers. It'll have an impact on your profits. What it means is that, uh, Mr Comerford, you've been making huge profits on the back of underpaying women. Would you agree with that? 
No, that's why we are uh, vehemently defending uh, um, these claims. Um, the pay in our stores and our distribution centres um, is the same for colleagues doing the same jobs, regardless of gender. Um, what you are referencing is the fact that the retail jobs and the distribution um, centres operate differently and therefore um, are in different sectors with different skills and therefore get, people get remunerated differently for the, the different areas that they work in. It has nothing to do with gender. Um, look, the case is really complicated. It's a complex case. There's no precedent in the private sector that I'm aware of, and therefore we are aware of the, uh, the conversation that will continue until September 24. Okay, thank you. Um, colleagues, I'm going to call colleagues that haven't had a chance to ask a question in that order, if that's okay. And if there's time at the end, then I'll reallocate it to others. So I'm going to go um, Sir Robert, uh, Anthony, Ian, and Andy in that order. Sir Robert. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Lavery touched on the sort of relative power of supermarkets compared to processors and manufacturers, and certainly compared to farmers at the sort of bottom end of what literally is the food chain. And I'd like to direct my uh, uh, question to Mr. Gaffer. Uh, Mr. Potts talked about what happened this time last year in the egg market, and um, although bird flu did have an impact, only about 0.25% of the chickens in this country were affected. I mean, geese, turkeys, it was carnage, but. Um, but what we did see, we saw the price of chicken feed doubling following the, the invasion of Ukraine. And when the packers came to the supermarkets and said, look, you're going to have to do something, otherwise we won't have any eggs by the autumn, the supermarkets said, basically, no, we've got a contract. You can supply at that price. And what happened then is that as the sort of 13-month cycle of laying hens came round, a number of producers either retired or didn't fill up their sheds. So come the autumn... Uh, there weren't any eggs and you had to ship them in from, from Italy. So do you think in their, in their quest to actually absolutely drive down prices, sometimes the supermarkets lose touch with the reality of producing food and say, well, you know, we don't care. You know, these farmers are going to lose money. They're going out of business. We don't care because we can sell eggs cheaply today, whereas in, this, in the case of pork and, 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 and eggs and, and broilers, actually the long-term effect was, was not to the benefit of your customers. Yeah, thank you, Sir Robert. Um, it, it, I'll... I am the commercial director for packaged food, so I don't look after fresh. However, I do have a little bit of knowledge, having worked in some fresh departments, so I'll answer to the best of my knowledge. Uh, we have, as Tesco, we have never shipped any Italian eggs. We have no intention to ship any European eggs. We are committed to 100% British, first and foremost. Um, and this was in my time, actually, setting up our um, commodities team, as we call it, where we opened up and I believe we were leaders in the industry, um, open, open cost models with our uh, egg as well as chicken suppliers, where we go all the way up to feed and transparently make joint decisions with our uh, packers on when to buy that feed. We've done five-year contracts uh, on areas like eggs, for example, which is a big commitment, but we recognize it's required. Our commitment to British eggs Fresh British chicken. I think remains. that was the problem. There were long term contracts which didn't take account of the short term fluctuations in. On inputs. Tesco specifically, those contracts, again, to the best of my knowledge, are transparent and do vary <coughs> on feed because we go all the way to looking at wheat pricing and soya pricing with the packers and determine when we should buy together. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, last year we paid 28 million more to the egg industry to support those really hard times that you refer to. You think maybe there could be more collaborative working, say following the example of McCain Foods, who actually contract with their farmers based on the price of fuel, machinery, all the other inputs they need. Do you think maybe we need a little bit more collaboration rather than just, you know, your guys with their sort of red braces on in your purchasing department crushing people trying to supply you? Uh, as I say, we, we, number one for seven years running in the Advantage Survey, which includes our fresh food, far, our, our fresh food suppliers as well as our packaged food <coughs> suppliers, is uh, an indication of how we collaborate. Again, supplier satisfaction, our own viewpoint that we send to suppliers, 86%, really high numbers. Um, I, I am a huge advocate of transparency in the, in the supply chain. I remember um, having some uh, really quite, um, at the time, um, may call them revolutionary, I don't know, maybe it's too big a word, but changing conversations that we're really proud to have adopted and stuck with, and I think have helped many farmers continue to be aligned with Tesco. Let's not forget the Tesco Sustainable Dairy Group, which has been in place for more than 10 years, 
we believe, and it's there to see, we've paid more than 300 million to those 500 aligned farmers that are specifically dedicated to Tesco, 500 million more over the lifespan of the Tesco Sustainable Dairy Group. I've visited quite a few of those farmers. They're really proud and we're really proud of working with them. Um, and we have more sustainable groups that are and have launched. So m more transparency is not something that we're against with our suppliers at all. Thank you. Maybe to um, Ms Bartlett, um, there's been some speculation about a possible statutory or voluntary price cap for customers. Would, would you say that would be workable or, or advantageous? Well, the, the way we it's a very fiercely competitive industry that we work in, and we've talked quite a lot this morning, haven't we, about how much we're watching and matching each other's prices all of the time. So uh, we're waiting, of course, to hear what the CMA have to say about it, but m my observation would be this is fiercely competitive as a market. We're generally considered one of the most competitive food markets in the world. Um, I'm not sure what price caps would add to that process um, other than bureaucracy where we've seen um, them applied in France and so on it can have um, unintended consequences of selling out and other prices moving up and down around so I think this market self-regulates to a, um, a positive extent so it, we wouldn't be in support of price caps. Did you have a similar experience with eggs because I mean this time last year there were 43 million laying birds in the country by the autumn that was down to 38 million and that wasn't bird flu that was just farmers losing money and going out of eggs despite yeah. what we heard Mr. Gallus say. So eggs um, is one of the most fragmented supply chains that we deal with. So we've spent the last 10 or 20 years sort of supporting the consolidation of different supply chains so that we can play a more active um, role in making sure safe and good value food comes through the system. Eggs probably is further behind some of the other value chains. Uh, we primarily deal with packers and not with farmers, and I think that's been a problem um, over the last 12 months or so. We have imported eggs from Italy because we wanted customers to have eggs. We have a policy that we want to be 100% British, but there wasn't the supply, mm. and there hasn't been the supply for um, the best part of a year. That is coming back on stream now. Um, the suppliers tell me that um, new egg sheds, there's long delays in planning permissions, so if I could land one and ask, ones it would farmers, be for There's that. plenty of empty sheds up and down the country that farmers didn't fill when the, this time last year and during the summer. That yeah. was the problem. Yeah, so the, I mean, the farmers that we're engaging with as we try and get further back into the supply chains are calling out planning permission as something that would help them at this stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ian Byrne. Uh, uh, th thanks, Jay. I'm going to ask three questions, so just yes or no answer. Uh, Spartlett just touched on one when the one I'd asked, but if you look, uh, the images of baby formula milk in locks, it haunts me, I hope it haunts you. Uh, in light of what the IMF, IMF reported today about profiteering causing inflation, would you, like your counterpart in France, cap or support capping essential uh, items, Gordon? Uh, yes or no? We, we, no, no, yes or no, I've got no time. Um, you, you, you can't compare France to the UK in my view. Oh, no, you can, yeah, when you've got baby locks around for milk. I'm asking a question, can you just give me an answer, yes or no, would you support? We don't believe price caps don't believe it. Would, Chris, be, would be helpful. Same. Don't support price caps. David? Uh, presumably not. Yes or no, David? Well, uh, I, I'm just checking in on the question, right? Yeah. Do you support price caps on essential food items like baby milk, which are now it's locked? Caps, in other words, I, I, I would say competition lead, leads you to the right place, actually. Okay. The, the industry requires volume, and you'll see it come. Right. Okay. Uh, so moving on to, uh, in light of where we are with the huge public health crisis we face from obesity, a lot of it's down largely to ultra-processed foods. Do you support the government's decision to delay a further two years to October 2025, the introduction of volume price promotions on food high in fat, sugar and salt? Yes or no, Gordon? We're not No, doing yes or no, Gordon? I think you need to explain. We're not doing no, no, okay, any... Got, generally, not, we haven't got the I'm time. Agree, I'm agreeing with you, but we're not doing any... Do you agree with the government's sugar, position? Salt and sugar multibuys. We have said no from the outset. Okay, so you don't agree with the government's position. Chris? 
Look, I'm fine with the government delaying the... Um, okay, you agree with it, Ryan? We, we haven't run multi-buys on HFSS products since 2016. Okay, so you don't agree with it. Well done. David? Yeah, I, I think our job is to execute government legislation, and that's what we're doing. Okay. So, are you, uh, again, yes or no, are you promoting fresh fruit and veg to the same extent as food, high in fat, salt and sugar? Gordon? What's the question again, sir? Are you promoting fresh fruit and vegetables in a, to the same extent as you're promoting food high in fat, sugar and salt? So we believe that fresh food should be as much off promotion and competitive at everyday low price as possible. This, when you walk into our stores, you see fruit and veg promotions. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do. Yeah. We, we do absolutely. Great stuff, David. Yeah, we, we give it away. Even, so yeah. Okay. So the last question: Do you agree with the food minister that obesity can be successfully tackled primarily through just informing customers? Gordon? Just informing customers about the effects of obesity instead of actually bringing in measures to tackle it. The nanny state. Not sure. Um, I think it needs more than this. I think the helping customers with healthy, sustainable choices, whether that's what we can do to help reformulate products, is, is why we're Government you do policy. That? Pardon? Or government policy? Well, then I would agree with anything that helps uh, customers <coughs> um, reformulate products for them. Ms. Bot, yeah? We, we supported HFSS. It's just um, a frustration that only one of the three elements of the policy has actually been implemented. So we've relayed all of our stores. But the multi buy component, the advertising component, isn't in place. And I think on its own, um, location of products probably isn't enough to make a difference. Very good. David? Well, I'm thinking it's a big question. We are opening in food desert, fresh food desert, places by buying McCall's. You'll have seen it in, in Liverpool, I think, actually. But yeah, we'll do everything we can, right? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Just very, very quickly, uh, Rianne, you said that Sainsbury's had put a voluntary ban on high um, fat, sugar, and salt uh, multi buys. Um, but there's some evidence to suggest that you are price discounting for your loyalty customers for HFSS products. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. So we, we, we run promotions, but we don't run multi buy promotions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. We've touched on convenience stores. A little bit the smaller model but i want to just uh, touch on them again i think between the four of you you've got about three and a half thousand convenience stores the absolute lion's share with you uh, mr gaffer and tesco you must have seen the recent which study which said that customers who rely on those smaller convenience stores the tesco express sainsbury's local morrison's daily and i think it's as the local or as direct express um now um the which report said that they that customers couldn't access a decent range of cheap, healthy food. Would you agree with that categorisation, Mr. Gaffer? Um, our, our ranging in Express, um, a first and foremost, we are really very competitive in Express, and again, we compare our pricing um, weekly in that channel. Um, our, our ranging in Express is based on customer insight, and um, we do make um, really careful choices because there's a lot of brands that we range in Express that are very important to the customers that shop locally in those stores. Sorry, when you say you do it based on customer insight, is it that based on customer demand or by research you're conducting? Uh, a bit of both, so um, we, yeah, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say in, the, in our Bolton Express, it, we decide that um, because we just want to range on label, we won't have any uh, of the branded bread. I think we'd have a little bit of a problem because of the loyalty that certain branded suppliers have in those stores, and that's what I mean. Um, we, just on the point on affordability, we have last year introduced club card prices also in Express to make sure that our promotions are also available in that channel. I mean, you'll have seen in the same which report that they say that the customers who rely on those stores, so they're not using it for convenience. The ones who rely on those stores are typically lower income with less access to cars or good public transport. So what are you doing to help make sure in those stores there are better, there's a better range of own brand essentials and what more could you do? 
We do constantly review our ranges. In fact, this year we are reviewing all the vast majority of our merchandising groups to be, to be accurate. So we'll be constantly looking to see if there's areas where we can um, help with different introductions. But as I say, through really competitive pricing across that convenience market and through the, the, the value that Club Car gives, um, we, we think we deliver really good... Um, Would you agree with the categorisation that the customers who rely on those stores are typically lower income. Is that your experience? There's, there's a broad, uh, in my experience, there is a broad, it depends on location, there's a broad customer base, and we're proud to serve millions of customers through, through those. Uh, through those. Okay, businesses. so there are some of those convenience stores that will have a lower income demographic who rely on them. In those stores, are you prioritising essential <coughs> items and own brand over others? Um, we, we range in those stores that we believe, you know, or the ranges that are relevant for those customers. Um, if there are any specifics that we need to look at, I'm happy to take it away. If there's any real important ones that we're missing, we don't get it always right. Uh, but we think we're competitive. We've just opened our 2000 Express store because we really see the importance of being where customers want us to be. Okay. Um, Ms. Bartlett, I think you're the second biggest uh, in terms of convenience stores. Are you doing enough to help those who rely on those stores? Yes, yeah, so as I said earlier, that um, we would range according to the customer mission. So we don't find customers um, in the most part would use a convenience store as their main shop. So most of them are in city and town centres and cater to a lunchtime and a just after work dinner mission. Um, we do have some that we call neighbourhood hubs, which are in more neighbourhood areas. Those catchments are really well served <coughs> by supermarkets. We're very rarely the only store. Um, we would range according to demand also, um, but we segment that demand. We use a lot of our loyalty data to support us with this, um, according to which um, missions that customer is shopping in those stores so that we can give them we have very very constrained ranges we need to give customers what they want to buy in that store on that day um, knowing that most of their shop is going to a larger supermarket or, or to an online offer okay mr pot i come to you you're obviously growing quite significantly <laughs> yeah position. me personally but yeah <clears throat> i think um first of all thank you for the idea i think i think it's a well-made point if i may say uh, I was on a housing estate in Aberdeen a couple of weeks ago and that felt like the, the type of thing you're getting at. Whereas there's a Tesco Express right outside that tube station over the road, which I think has got a different level of elasticity right now, and I take that point. Um, as you say, we're new into this game, but I believe there's plenty of own brand in the convenience stores across Britain. Um, we have lowered the prices opposite McCall's to ten, by up to 10% where you go, when you go to Morrison's Daily as a conversion. But I am happy to shove a few savers that we talked about earlier in this meeting into those stores, especially up until the uh, food inflation normalises in this country. I think it would be a good thing to do, particularly in those areas where people are relying on that site. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you very much. Um, just one final question, if I can. Um, so if we think about the, the customers we're talking about, uh, more vulnerable, lower income, less access to cars and public transport. Mm. Um, Mr. Gaffer, at Tesco, you've got a minimum online order of £50. With, <clears throat> and if you don't hit that, you pay a surcharge. Are you just pricing out lower income families from online shopping? Uh, that, that £50 minimum basket. And that is double, by the way, the Morrison's minimum order. Um, the £50 minimum basket uh, charge is the first uh, change that we've done to that level in uh, eight years. Uh, average, average, basket, average basket size uh, uh, online is uh, £90. So, um, and, and also, by the way, there's click and collect, which <coughs> is still at um, £25 with regards to minimum We're basket. We're talking specifically about customers who can't access yeah. Yeah. car. Yeah. So uh, you're pricing out, the, you know, unless you can click and collect, go to a different supermarket if you want your online shopping? Oh, as I said, I believe that um, with the average basket size being £90, £50 is um, reasonable with regards to the first change we've done to that uh, minimum basket size in, in eight years. 
uh, and with inflation, with the inflationary pressures, uh, and the number of online orders that we're serving, we're at about 1.1 million orders, <coughs> and significantly higher versus what it was uh, before the pandemic. There was okay, a so you need this correction. Average shop is not necessarily those on the lower income. Um, Ms. Bartlett, your minimum order is slightly lower, you're at £40, but your surcharge is higher at £7. Do you think that's fair for a low-income household to pay a surcharge of £7? Um, I, I'm going to need to take that one away, actually. I, I, I need to get a little bit closer, probably, to where we've got surcharges. I know um, click and collect works, but it doesn't answer your point because um, you need a car to click and collect. Thank you. Andy McDonald, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, how much are you planning to pay out in dividends this year? And how do these figures compare to the dividends paid out to shareholders over the last five years? What's that? Uh, the Tesco dividend is um, 10.9 pence, which is flat <coughs> year on year. Mr. Comerford? We're privately owned. We haven't announced our dividend yet. That's coming up very soon. We've currently got no plans to pay any dividends this year. Oh, right. OK. Um, well, I've got something in front of me that tells me that the, the Tesco and Sainsbury's annual report and accounts so, show that you plan to pay £859 million and £309 million the three hundred nineteen million pounds in dividends in twenty twenty three, and that, according to Unite, that's your highest common dividend since twenty fifteen, and that's higher than last year. In twenty twenty two, Tesco paid out seven hundred and thirty one pounds, thirty one million pounds in dividends, and Sainsbury's paid out dividends of two hundred and thirty eight million. Do those figures ring true with you? For Tesco specifically, we paid last year 10.9 pence, and we're paying this year again 10.9 pence. Uh, we shouldn't forget many of our shareholders are also small retail shareholders that do rely on dividends, and many of our shareholders are actually colleagues of the business as well that do supplement their income with the dividends that the business uh, pays out. Arthur, do you respond um, on our, the behalf? We're, we're expecting to announce a dividend that's roughly flat year on year. Okay. Um, that's that's uh, really interesting. But can I come back to you, uh, Mr. Gaffer? Um, we have got figures in our brief that show us that the uh, increase in uh, the share dividend has increased by 89% since 2018-2019. Is that something that you would recognise? Is it accurate, or in the, or in the in the in the area? We, I haven't got the 2018 number with me, but um, we, as I, am a, I am the commercial director for Package Food, so I'm, I'm, yeah. I can give it to you, Mr. Gaffer, if you'd like it. Um, Tesco 2018-19, uh, 5.8 pence. Tesco 22-23, 10.9 pence. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we, we, it's important to remember that at Tesco we have been busy restructuring the business and, the, the, and making sure we are building it. We rebuilt a little bit. Um, to make sure that we are the best for customers um, throughout the last uh, eight years. And the growth and dividend progression reflects the growth of the health of the business to make sure that Tesco is in a um, sustainable place to be able to serve as many customers as we can. Do you, do you understand that you have said this uh, throughout this morning's session that the focus is upon customers to delivering the best outcomes for, from them? I'm putting to you figures here about the dividend uh, payouts, which tends to suggest that the focus is, is elsewhere, uh, and that really does uh, uh, really impact upon people. I think it's been said before that you know, this business isn't about selling food, it's about making money. I think one of your predecessors said that some years ago. You've talked about it being fiercely competitive, but it's obviously fiercely profitable uh, as well. Um, and can I go on then just to look at, um, I'm looking at Sainsbury's annual report uh, and the chief executive, I think that's Mr. Mr. Roberts, um, he's paid almost £4 million in, in, in bonuses on top of his uh, salary. Uh, you know, and I, I'd really like to know how they, you justify that in the, in the midst of a cost of living crisis. 
Um, I think if, if you look at Mr. Roberts, that's 4.9 million, 408,000 pounds a month, 94,000 pounds a week, 2,298 £2, pounds an hour, and workers are paid 11 pounds an hour. I mean, you know, how is that justifiable when people, the people who work for you and the people who come into the stores are suffering from a grotesque cost of living crisis now? How can that possibly be justified? Well, as a listed company, you'll know that all of our board directors' um, salaries are published. Um, no, that's they're one set point, by no. the Remco. I don't sit on the Remco. I don't have any remit over setting any of those salaries, um, so I can't really comment any further on that today. Do you not get the point that you know the, this, this discussion is couched around a, a cost of living crisis? And yet, you know, I've got to say, the chief executives across the board are in the same ballpark in terms of their, 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 their pay. Do you, not, do you not understand how that sits with the general public, that these sorts of wages are being paid? And you tell us that your purpose is to provide the most reasonably priced food for, for your customers, <coughs> and yet dividends are paid out and these salaries at this level. Does that not chime with any of you? can make football tickets cheaper if they pay the players less. No, I, that's just I absolutely, know. utterly staggering, quite frankly. Um, Chair, I just want to finish with a, a point that, that my colleague, Mr Lavery, raised about ASDA in the South East. And I ask you, Mr Comerford, will ASDA commit to collectively bargain on paying conditions for its retail workers, the majority of whom are women? Will you commit today to collective bargaining? A collective, but so what we will do recognition of the GMB and collectively bargain with them over these matters. We have a, a, an open relationship with the GMB. We speak with the GMB uh, um, collectively and to, together, and we speak with them uh, frequently. And we will discuss anything with them. Will you collectively bargain with them? Will you will you will you enter into collective bargaining agreement with the GMB? As chief commercial officer, stand here today. I can't commit to that, but absolutely, I will uh, take it away with my team, and we will discuss it at a board level. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, we've timed out, unfortunately, but we may have to come back to some further questions, either in subsequent written form uh, or maybe in further hearings. And I know our colleagues on the EFRA Committee are looking at the structural issues under pricing, uh, underpinning food price changes as well. So I look forward to the evidence that your organisations give to them. And of course, we've got the CMA reports coming as well, which may be a reason for us to come, to come back to you. But thank you to all four of you for this morning. We're now going to do a very quick changeover and welcome in the Groceries Code Adjudicator. Um, Mark To you and we will have to finish at midday today um, I'm afraid um, the first question just, uh, just for the record for people watching could you please explain uh, what it is you, you and your organization does indeed thank you chair so I'm Mark White I'm the groceries code adjudicator and I'm the person appointed to regulate the groceries code uh, between the 14 designated retailers selling more than a billion pounds a year each of groceries and their direct suppliers. And what specifically does your organisation have in terms of powers around food price inflation? So, uh, food price inflation um, in terms of pricing itself is not part of the code. So either retail pricing to consumers or retailers pricing with suppliers. However, um, inflation clearly is a concern across the economy and in this se sector in particular and I'm very conscious of everything that the committee has heard today in terms of consumer pricing and so having engaged with suppliers about the process for setting uh, cost price increases I set out uh, to agree with the retailers seven golden rules in January 2022 
to regulate the way in which those cross-price negotiations are conducted, to provide transparency, to provide detail about how long the process would take, so to ensure that the process is fair, although I cannot set price. One of the things that I'm left with, having listened to the evidence just now, is a concern that whilst we might have a competitive market, uh, the kind of customer front door in the supermarkets, that the resilience of the structure doesn't feel like it's in the right place. They're all very um, exposed to international events, whether it's climate, uh, supply chain disruption, energy prices, uh, paperwork, uh, tariffs, you know, all of that type of stuff seems to be adding a lot of cost and a, a lack of resilience underpinning the supermarkets. Um, and we've seen that in the energy sector recently and had to deal with the consequences of that. Are you, are you worried about the resilience of our food supply chains in the UK? Um, so look, my priorities are informed by what is going on in the sector and also by what suppliers are telling me and they tell me things in confidence because I have a statutory obligation of confidentiality. And since my appointment, there have been all sorts of issues that have faced the sector. So during the pandemic, it was really about suppliers and retailers working constructively together to deliver product on shelf for consumers. As we began to come out of the pandemic, some of those issues that you've just spoken about, Chair, have come to the fore. So we've seen shortages, shortages of raw ingredients, um, issues around HGV drivers, labours, that morphed into inflation generally. So the committee heard very uh, a few minutes ago about the cost of feed and how that has fed in. Um, shortages again on raw ingredients, packaging costs that have all led to inflation. And so this is a, a very dynamic sector. Um, energy prices, as you've just mentioned, have really impacted. And what I'm hearing from a number of suppliers that I'm engaged in is that this could result in insolvencies mm. in their businesses. So putting them out of business and therefore there would not be supply to retailers and therefore choice for the consumer on the shelf. Do you know, has anybody, I don't know whether this is government or you or the industry, has anybody done an assessment of uh, the security of the food supply chain in terms of the, a resilience assessment? Have they looked at that holistically? Um, at the Farm to Fork Summit that was held in Downing Street last month, that issue of food security, bringing suppliers and representatives from the supply side and producers together with some of the retailers um, was very much uh, the theme to begin to look about how we address that holistic issue of making sure there is proper supply, local supply perhaps, um, to provide consumers with choice. Thank you. Uh, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Mr White. Um, I've just got three, uh, hopefully quite quick questions. Um, looking at the, uh, the 2023 survey, it's obviously uh, good to see that the uh, percent compliance you know, is increasing, um, but I wonder what the severity of non-compliance is. Is it the case that whilst compliance has increased, the severity of non-compliant cases has increased? So the results of the 2023 survey, as you said, show uh, an improvement in code compliance, notwithstanding the very difficult year uh, that we have seen in the sector. So if I look back 10 years, code compliance was at 73% in 2014. On average now, it's 92% in my 2023 survey. To your point about individual issues, 79% of respondents in the 2014 survey reported that they had had code issues with retailers. In 2023, that was 36%, so a reduction. 11 out of the 13 retailers uh, who were part of the 2022 survey increased their compliance scores, with 8 out of 13 increasing by more than 3%. And if, for example, I look at m and their score of 99% was the highest ever score achieved in a survey. So year on year, there are always pockets of issues which arise. And the way in which I deal with those is to engage with each retailer on their results to work on an improvement plan 
to deliver an improvement, but it's very bespoke because quite often the issues are very individual to individual retailers. But you wouldn't, or would you say that, um, you know, take a typical supermarket, it's, it's done all the uh, low hanging fruit, for want of a better phrase, and so the only issues left for non commercials are the really complex, serious breaches. That's not what you're seeing. No. Right. Okay. Um, Obviously, Amazon was included for the first time in 2023. It's at the bottom of the table, um, but historically, that's where, uh, when the code first came out, that's where you would expect it to be. What plans have you got to work with Amazon to increase that? So, uh, as you say, uh, bottom of the table, and it is, of course, concerning. Um, but if you look back, at 2014, that score is not too dissimilar mm. to what retailers were scoring back 10 years ago. And retailers' scores have improved across the 10-year period since the survey started. Amazon has made changes to its processes, so it has made changes to delisting, it has made changes to notification of deductions on forensic audit claims. What the survey helps me do is really pinpoint those areas for Amazon on which it needs to work, and I will be engaging with Amazon to work up an improvement plan. And that is no different to the approach that I will adopt with all of the retailers. Do you feel you're getting the right level of engagement from Amazon to dramatically increase their compliance in short order? I am getting the right level of engagement. There sometimes is a little time delay between taking action to correct something or to correct a perception and it delivering results. Um, I would very much encourage Amazon to look at its communication to suppliers to really tell them what it is that they are doing uh, to change. And of course, uh, if I may use this opportunity to remind suppliers to please come and talk to me if they are experiencing issues with right. Amazon. I have an absolute obligation of confidentiality. Have you seen a, uh, leads me on to another point, have you seen a, a significant increase in the number of suppliers coming to you since Amazon was brought into the code? Um, so at around the time of designation, which was in March 2022, there was an uptick in the number of suppliers coming not just to me, but also going to the co-compliance officer at Amazon. So I very much encourage suppliers to go to the co-compliance officer to raise issues. Um, but then that plateaued and has come down. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to turn very briefly to uh, indirect suppliers, such as Daryl. I just want your general view on expanding the code to include them. So I recognise um, that such a change would be welcomed by uh, some primary producers. Um, primary producers provide me with very detailed and very useful insight. And I don't differentiate in my engagement with suppliers between indirect and direct because, as far as I'm concerned, all of their information is very helpful. Um, the existing work I do, I hope, benefits primary producers. So my seven golden rules in terms of clarity on a CPI process, I hope, filters down to the primary producer. And my interventions with retailers, so asking them to have buyers enroll for two years to improve their understanding of the category. Uh, crop growing cycles is an example where I'm really hoping that buyers will better understand the challenges that are faced by suppliers. Commercial models adopted by the retailers change, so many uh, retailers adopt um, a model where they go through a consolidator or a buying desk. Um, but other retailers uh, contract directly. Today's primary producer is tomorrow's direct supplier and a little bit vice versa. Um, I think that any changes to scope uh, would require an examination of whether the powers that the GCA has are appropriate for a wider scope. Uh, we'd need to look at resourcing um, at the moment, I'm regulating a relatively small number of um, retailers with a relatively small team. 
Uh, if that were to change, I think that we would just need to understand what the financing implications would be and how the operating model for the GCA would need to be adapted to ensure that it was both effective and efficient. You could see a benefit to bringing it into your remit, providing you were resourced appropriately to do so. Indeed, but the, I think the assessments would need to be done first. Thank you. Thank you. Andy? Yes, please, please. Uh, Chair. You, you mentioned the word power, uh, which interests me, um, because you talked an awful lot about engagement and encouragement. Um, but, but there's a power imbalance, isn't there, between retailers and suppliers here, which is fundamental to this. We heard from the EFRA chair that you know people uh, risk going out of business, and you said it yourself, Mr. White, about and those goods not being on the on the shelves. So, is there something to address there fundamentally in this relationship, and, and and what sort of work do you think would be needed to be done to correct it, if indeed you think it does need correcting? So the, the code exists to address that power imbalance. Uh, as identified by the Competition Commission back uh, when it reported in 2008. And uh, at its heart, it is about transparency in the relationship. It is about not transferring unexpected costs and risks to suppliers. Uh, and I think that fundamentally it works. Um, but I should say that a number of retailers do say to me uh, that there are several suppliers uh, to them who are exponentially larger than them. And so the power imbalance isn't always necessarily retailer on supplier. Um, sometimes we see it the other way around. But, but what's the proportion? Uh, is it more retail, more supplier, or is it invariably retailers with power and suppliers with not? not? Um, I think as a general proposition, retailers yeah. bigger than suppliers. Uh, but there are pockets of suppliers who are much bigger than retailers as a whole, and then perhaps in certain categories. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a coup. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Ian. Thanks. Um, just in line with what, uh, what Andy's just been saying with regards to the suppliers and the, the GC here, uh, uh, reportedly, uh, suppliers have been feared in the past to come forward with any evidence of any non-compliance to the GCA, uh, and I, I surmise that this is largely because of they might lose the contract. I mean, and, and that's understandable. I should, I should imagine. Uh, it, it, it appears to be slightly better now than what it was. I'm just wondering what sort of assurances can you give to the suppliers in the main that uh, you know coming forward with evidence uh, the le legislation the regulations that you've got in place actually are there to protect them um, so my statutory obligation of confidentiality is absolute and I take every opportunity to remind suppliers um, that that exists and that I will protect their identity um, but I have worked with the retailers because I recognise this issue and uh, I secured the retailers' agreement in 2021 that co-compliance officers at the retailers will listen to the concerns of all suppliers on a confidential basis, so effectively extending my confidentiality obligation to the retailers and to pass control over confidentiality to the supplier. So it is up to the supplier to decide when or if it is comfortable with information being shared further within the retailer organisation. Earlier this year, I extended that CCO confidentiality commitment uh, with all of the retailers agreeing that suppliers would not face any negative consequences should a supplier come to a retailer to report a code issue. So no retaliation, no negative consequences, and then that is being policed within their organisations. Uh, in 2021, I set up a completely anonymous 24-7 Tell the GCA reporting platform. It's available um, in numerous languages to enable overseas suppliers to contact me. 
um, and it enables those suppliers who still do not wish to come to me and tell me their name to report a practice or an issue completely anonymously. And I make it known to suppliers that I will meet them in any way that they feel comfortable, be it online, be it face-to-face, -face, telephone, email, however they wish to engage and reassure them of that obligation of confidentiality that I have. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr White, I think you sat through the first session uh, and heard the answers from the supermarkets. Uh, do you have any reflections on their answers to our questions? Um, I think that um, you know, what I heard from suppliers um, as inflation began to take off was the difficulty of penetrating um, the retailer organisations. Uh, who do you speak to? How do you get a cost price increase um, agreed? And I think the sheer volume took people by surprise. Hence, I worked with them on the seven golden rules to improve uh, the processes. And I think that whilst um, retailers' answers to cost price increase requests are shown in my 2023 survey are not always the answers that the supplier wants. The processes now are much smoother. Um, I think they've understood the volume. Uh, they've got the. They've organised themselves to make sure that they are able to touch the data that they need in order to make their decisions. And um, I think we heard from Ms. Bartlett about uh, potential for inflation to have plateaued. That doesn't mean prices are going down, just going up less uh, fast, uh, but then perhaps coming down. And I'm keen to make sure that my seven golden rules and those principles that we've established work on the way down as they did on the way up. One of the interesting changes in the supermarket um, market is the change in ownership structure. Um, so we've got a couple that are still publicly mm. listed, Tesco and Sainsbury's. Um, and then we have Asda that's just been bought privately, but with a very heavy leveraged debt um, uh, purchase method. And then we've got Morrison's that's just been bought by, I think I'm right saying, a private equity uh, company. Uh, do you have any early signs that the change in ownership or corporate governance is affecting the behavior of the supermarkets in any way? No. Not yet. Okay. Super. Anything else you wanted to say to us before we wrap up? Um, just please, if your constituencies and the, uh, in, sorry, the businesses in your constituencies, if they do need to contact me, uh, if I could please ask you to um, share my name and my details, that would be very helpful. We'd be very happy to do that. Thank you for bearing with us today, and sorry that it was so short at the end, but we're very grateful to you. Uh, you. We'll now call the session to an end. Uh, order, order.